It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing my buddy for since day one. I, I know you as E. Lizzie. That's what is what is what does everyone else know yet? Well, is Elizabeth my Curran? Professional, my professional name is Elizabeth. Um, my family calls me Sis. Um, my friends in England call me Lizzie, but I always sign uh, E. Lizzie. And for the longest time, everybody called me just E until E became a thing. <laughs> and now, but uh, Lizzie's good. And I'm where like did that. E Lizzie come from? Um, that was your internet sign off? Uh, my actual, that was just how I signed off on the internet because it's faster than E Elizabeth. Um, e Tukey came from. Uh, I you used, had a lab out here. Yeah, uh, well, I lived out here, and I had a lab, and when I moved to the valley in 92, all of the geographic names and town names were taken, except for Awatuki, because nobody can spell it, and so I took that, and then when the uh, internet came into popular use, so I started, I think, maybe 95, 96, we needed a, a some kind of handle, I guess. I don't know what they call it. And so I took E. Tukey, because Tukey's the nickname of Awatuki, as you know. And my husband took J. Tukey. And so we still have our original AOL account with that. But with e, so you're E. Tukey, you're E. Lizzie. Mm -hmm. So you were on the internet in 95. Yeah, really early. We had it sitting at, at the kitchen table. My dad was into computers, and he kind of pushed me into, it was never my comfort zone. And he actually helped develop the first program between the VA hospital, Loma Linda, and the March Air Force Base, where they had uh, integrated health records, which is, that was in the... 80s sometime and so uh, when um, personal computers came out he bought one for my husband and I and we kept it beside the bed for a long time just as a nightlight and then you know just over the course of time I started using it. So where did Dennis well let me read your bio first because oh, this is going to be a big treat for you. E. Lizzie has been what, what do you want me to call you today? Lizzie. Uh, Lizzie. Just Lizzie. Lizzie yeah. Lizzie has been in the dental laboratory business for 41 years. She started when she was three. And uh, <laughs> I mean, 41 years. And I'm telling you, of all the aspects of dentistry, the dental laboratory changed more than, any than other general area. dentistry, than hygiene, than yeah. anything. So Elizabeth is a formally educated dental technician and holds a teaching credential in health science and related technologies from the state of California. Elizabeth will be celebrating 42 years as a dental technician on September 15th. She is a board certified dental laboratory technician, ceramic specialty from the U.S. National Board of Certification Dental Laboratory Technology, and a registered dental technician qualification with the U.K. General Dental Council and is a member of the ACP Technician Alliance. During the course of her tenure, Elizabeth has helped expand and identify the scope of dental technicians in the dental profession. Examples of her involvement include National Association of Dental Laboratories, development of a national skill standard, um, Federation European of Dental Laboratories, DOSUM project facilitated the development of a mechanism to coordinate and map education standards and curriculum between EU dental technology education programs of the 19 member states. Trustee Commission on Dental Accreditation, former board member NADL and NBC, founding chair Foundation Dental Laboratory Technology, initiated the coordination of dental technicians who participate on the ANSI ISO Dental Committee for multiple countries, lead dental volunteer in the development of these free clinics, St. Vincent de Paul Watkins Dental Clinic, Arizona, Catholic Charities SOS Dental Clinic, Southern Cal, St. Anthony Greek Orthodox Cloistered Monastery Dental Clinic, Arizona. You know, my oldest sister is a cloistered Carmelite monk. Those That's are the Greek kind of, Orthodox. And yeah. uh, the cloister thing is phenomenal. The uh, monk that um, started that clinic was a USC graduate third in his class, went on a religious mission to Greece, fell in love with the monastic life, and then he decided um, 
to become a monk, gave up dentistry, but after so many years at this monastery, they allowed him to open a little clinic and out of the blue he called me and I thought it was an affiliation with St. Vincent de Paul which I helped set up. So um, I helped him set up and he was allowed to um, talk to me. He had to get permission and I'd go to the monastery and you had to wear um, covered head, dressed to the ground, covered arms. And it kind of reminded me of Catholic Church when I was a kid. Um, but it was really a wonderful thing. That's out in the desert in Florence. Really? You still go out there? I, when we're passing through, I go. In Florence. It's beautiful. It's off. On the way to Casa Grande? Yeah. Off the, it's the back way to. And they still have a dental clinic? Yeah. They, as far as I know, they had a little. They treat, um, the old monks would rotate uh, Greece to Canada, Canada to this monastery, uh, receive their dental health um, checkups, um, and then continue on. I um, love talking to my sister because you have to check out, you have to completely check out of life, yeah. of all things reality, yes. and then you go into this cloistered environment and you're just like, wow, I am totally in a different world. But let's, uh, but back to dentistry, um, and by the way, I want you to know that the Catholic cloistered monastery nuns think the Greek Orthodox are kind of hippies. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I just want to throw that in there. We know. The hippie cloisters. The hippie cloisters. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Isn't that a commune? <laughs> so if you're thinking about joining a cloister, I recommend the Greeks, not the Catholics. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um. Gosh, Lizzie, I don't even know where to begin with you because, I mean, 41 years. When I got out of school in 1987, okay, you started in 74, so in 87, you'd already been in it. Um, um, I took algebra, I should know this, uh, like 13 in years. My first year of teaching. In 87? Yeah, I taught in a, um, as an adjunct part-timer in a dental technology program in Southern California. Okay, let's start right there. How many dental laboratory programs were there in 1974 and how many are there in 2016? I had to uh, test into a program. There was a uh, like dental school waiting list and an application process, a manual dexterity, and um, you tested in. And now they can't fill the programs. But how many how many programs were there in in seventy four? Um, would you guess? And how many are there today? Now I think now there are um, seventeen, eighteen maybe, and I think in the United States. In the United States, there, these are ADA accredited. There are occasional non -pro or for profit little programs yeah. in different places, but I believe um, in. When I applied was the heyday, and there was between, uh, I think, 60 and 70 programs. So 60 to 70 and 74, and today 16? Yes, and I can give you the exact stats. Could, could, you, yeah, could you email me the list of those schools? Yeah, I will. You know, I am a... Um, I don't want to talk, you know, you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, violence, but to me, it seems like the only two great societies that make anything amazing is always Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm. And their education systems are very big into trade. Like in America, they always talk about how great the economy is, right. but half the people that call a plumber to come fix their mm -hmm. toilet doesn't fix it right. So there's that transaction, the economy's great, but then poor mom has to call another plumber. Yeah. It just, it, America sells more shit than any, I mean, if you just took away mm -hmm. the shit that we sold, the right. crap, we'd still be one of the biggest economies in the world. Whereas Germany and Japan, they regulate all the trades. Like you just can't be a plumber. You can't be just a right. dental laboratory. Today. Everything is education, schooling. We, we are the last non third world country to not have a minimum educational mandate for dental technicians. So countries that have sophisticated educational systems uh, that are successful, like Germany and Japan, are, have ver are very vested in the educational process. I like the German model because it has an apprenticeship, just like I would like to see 
uh, GP dentists go into AEGD program per year. I think you end up being a better. Um, and and they do it throughout the whole economy. Like in America, anybody can be a plumber, uh, yeah. build house, sheetrock, roofer. Right. So in America, the average roofer is just no training. Right. But in Germany and Japan, where everything lasts a lifetime, yeah. it would all be apprenticeship. It all be training. But you you start talking like that in America and your buddies on uh, Facebook, like Mike Barr or, or yeah. like guys like that, that they, 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 they call that socialism or too much government. Um, well, America is so anti-government anything. One of um, my favorite, absolute favorite things about downtown is that you house the historical perspective on uh, the integration of uh, offshoring in the dental laboratory industry. Uh, you had Dental Town at a time when Clyde went offshore. Uh, the FDA visited his offshore facility, issued a letter in 2003, four around in there, and we were able on Dental Town to track that hit. You can go back and read that entire thread. It, it was at the time, and I think still is. Uh, one of the longest threads that we ever had. And it, it discussed all of uh, the things that revolved around that. But one of the things... What was the name of the thread? I can't remember. I think it was like Offshore Trade or something Off, like that. Offshore Dental Labs. Or yeah. And it started in... And where was Glidewell's Offshore Lab? Was it in Costa, Costa Rica? Rica? Costa Rica. Yeah. Which, um, if you're going to offshore somewhere, that's a very um, regulated, uh, heavily visited by the FDA. Um, and that's where Invisalign went. Invisalign uh, right. is it's, huge down there. Everybody wants to live there. The language barrier is minimal. Spanish is much easier to learn than um, Chinese. Yeah. So, it, I mean, to come out of there, I don't think says anything negative but the point I was trying to make is when you talk about the things that are wrong with dental technology or the structure of dental technology it all revolves around regulation because we're not licensed and we're not licensed because in the past we really didn't have uh, contact with um, the uh, patient and now that's really changed. We can talk about that next. But so anyway, uh, the basic things. Talk like, about that next, that the dental laboratory is what? Uh, we're starting to uh, expand our scope in towards a more clinical application of our skills. And that would be CERAC chair side. That would be uh, conversions. When did CERAC start to... Um I mean, I mean, I had the CEREC one, I think, in 87 or 88. Where I and mean, I visited and, uh, you and you had it sitting in the corner and it was dusty. Right. And because... Look, so it was difficult to use. Well, going back then, what the problem with CEREC the whole time was um, waiting for the Intel microprocessor and RAM. So when you talk to the CEREC coders, they knew in 87 of all the things they wanted to do. But the chips and the RAM were right. so small, and so it didn't really get amazing until Intel came out with okay. at least the Pentium chip. I'm one of the few technicians that love CEREC, and I loved CEREC before they had in lab. And the reason I love CEREC is because I've yet to meet a dentist that didn't apply themselves and use CEREC that didn't end up being a better dentist. So if you're owning your crappy prep and your bad impression in an operatory as you try to develop a device, you're going to improve or else you're going to see a lot of... For me, what it was with CIRAC, the, the main thing is that with kids, it's just magnification. I mean, if you add your naked eye with three and a half times yeah. loops, you're a better dentist. Uh, if you're an endodontist and you pull down a scope and look inside those canals just six to eight times, right. you're a much better dentist. And the first time I scanned my prep with CIRAC, I looked at that prep and thought a monkey did the prep. And, and you can blow it up. 40 and, times bigger. And now we have uh, at school, because I'm, um, besides being a bench technician, I'm a um, full-time associate professor 
Dental Laboratory Technology at Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health. And one of the things we've introduced, I was, I actually brought the CEREC into the school. I wrote the first. What uh, year was that? That was 2006. 2000, and who were the other champions in 2006 at that school? Didn't Eric, Har did Brian, Eric, Eric Harris? Eric came later. He came later, but he liked it. But uh, he, uh, so here's, here's. There's sorry, a, sorry to interrupt there. There's a whole thing <laughs> on the, okay, on CEREC and institution. So if you look at uh, an overlay of the integration of technology into any profession, you have um, early adapters, middle of the road guys, and late adapters. You overlay that concept along with um, digital natives and people that can barely turn on an iPhone. And so you have the average age of dental school faculty is in the 60s. Is it really? Yes, and I. So I'm a young one at 54. You're a baby. I'm a I'm a youngin. You're yeah, you are. <laughs> How old is Jack? Uh, Jack's 70 and he's retiring. He's 70. Yeah. And the average age of a dental school is in the is 60s. A, yeah, I think it's around uh, 62. Now is this just at your school or all no, America? No, national average. And the and national Adia, average. Idea has the average, and I'll find that for you. And it's about 62. I think it's actually more than 60. God, that is so, awesome. I haven't, I haven't been younger in any age bracket. See, there you are now. And it, oh, I, yeah. I can't remember last time I was in the young, the young category. So as we got the young guys and the young guns, like um, uh, Johnny and Elliot Brennan, um, Eric Harris, um, forget the other guys. Oh, anyway, the, as, as they've come in, the age of the faculty has changed. And they're starting to, uh, it's being embraced more. But the kicker, what's really integrating it onto the clinical floor in the educational institution is the fact that they have a program they use in the simulation lab where uh, it's called prep check, where you scan your prep and it analyzes the quality of your prep, gives you a statistic numerical. Now, Serona does that? Yes, Sarah had a prep check, yes. Sarah. And when do they come out with prep check? I think it's been in schools for um, four years. And is that on the standard sharing machine? I mean, does mine have that? Uh, no, I don't think... Um, huh. They have made that a... I don't think... A, it might be able to be programmed into... I think yeah. that it's not an issue of the machine accepting that software. It's the issue of they're only selling it to institutions, so it's not for. Now and I I'm heard. Sure, they're going to develop because I know D4D has it. I just talked to one of or E4D, whatever they're called. Um, that they're going to have a, a chair side kind of prep check where after you prep, you can go in and analyze your prep. You know, um, Cirac was. Um made from Serona, which used to be a big a branch of Siemens, which is like the largest right. company in, in Europe. And um, and then E4D just got bought by Plan Mecca yeah. out of um, uh, Helsinki, Finland. Yeah. So the, the, those are major companies. And I assume the prices will do, I mean, like anything. I mean, my, my first DVD player was 800 bucks. Right. And it was, and it was horrible. And now they're thirty-five dollars, and they're amazing. Do you do you think um, this technology will get I do more think and more the, the affordable? Competition, yeah, will be more affordable. I think in any industry, you can look across any industry, and um, it's like your first air, time you rode on an airplane. How much did your ticket cost? And now, um, I think that's going to happen. There are a lot of things that are going to bring those technologies out of laboratories. Into but look, but, uh, but let's uh, let's back up to um um, so so we're okay. So you you've been in this business four decades. Um, when I got to school in eighty seven, there were fifteen thousand labs. Now there's half that number. What what what's the uh, future of the dental laboratory? Are they going to okay. go away yes. or? No, I don't think they're going to go away. So what you see is diversion of um the scope of practice or what or and what laboratories are so you either have closely held small laboratories or you have big milling centers 
both of them use technicians in different ways. But where I see the dental technician moving is uh, actually away from laboratories and into a more clinical scope. And the minute you put the word clinical with dental technician, everybody in organized dentistry flips out because they think you're talking about denturists. No, what you're talking about is the technician that's going to sit in your office when you have a CEREC so that you can um, do multiple have multiple machines running and you're prepping and they're doing image capture except for the prep which you have to come back and capture that but they do all of the um, that and then they mill it and then um, I see adjustment and then conversions. Let's just stay right in Ahwatukee where you started your first lab. Yes. You, you what? I opened my office in '87 in Ahwatukee, and you were ninety three, four, I think. You were ninety four. Okay, so but basically, though, my homies out there, um, Ahwatukee. When I moved here, it was Ahwatukee, and then of course the big monster city of Phoenix annexed it. But I don't know anybody in Ahwatukee who's ever said they live in Phoenix. But we are Phoenix, Arizona. It's just um, it's just this area, 100% of the people call it Ahwatukee. But anyway, um, Ahwatukee, I don't know how many dentists are out here, about 50. But I'll, I'll just tell you what I, what I see with CIRAC. You, you got people who bought CIRAC who love it. You got people who use CIRAC who say, I used to be able to schedule one hour for a crown. And I could uh, numb, prep, temporize. They come back in two weeks for a 30-minute seat. But they found themselves at the time to mill it all out and cement it was sometimes two, three, four hours long. And so a lot of those people decided that they just like the oral scanning part of it. Right. So now they, they oral scan it, they see the prep bigger, they're better dentists, um, they're, they're digital. A lot of labs give a discount. Then you have other labs, uh, other dentists, and I don't want to say their names because they might get mad that I mentioned like Tom Maddern on Dentistry Uncensored. And uh, he, um, he stores all, he, so he um, perhaps numbs, temporizes, but leaves all the uh, preps in the machine, then has a dental laboratory person like yourself come out every Wednesday and mill them all out in the office. Right. And then they, they all come back to and see. And that's the expanding clinical scope yeah. of a dental technician. Yeah. yeah, like Frank Acosta, who uh, so, some dentists will, will load up uh, two, three days out in the middle of anywhere in the United States, and he'll load up all of his uh, prosthodontics, and he'll go out there, and they'll prep them and do, mill them. Yeah, you'll have... Three. He'll do 15 units a day. Yeah, and um, it's more common than you think. And there are a lot of um, laboratories that now have owned the, all of the technology. The CERAC um, pours them up and put it in a little van and they will go to your uh, office if you don't. Here in town? Um, I don't know if we have one in town, but they're uh, oh, all over. Business. Yeah, it could be. If you find me leads for that, that'd be some great. Uh, that that'd yeah, be a great story for Dental Town and a good podcast. Yes, yeah. and because I I, I I do see mobile dentistry the, um, taking off too. Mobile dental labs and mobile right. dentistry. There's we already have uh, pretty much every denture lab in Arizona will come to your office and do your conversions. So you have all on fours, and you're going to convert a denture and they'll show up there i think if i'm um if i can remember i think they go more to surgeon's office than your general dentist but uh, that's the other expansion of scope and then if you look at the already legalized clinical te dental technicians dentists they're expanding their scope and more educational programs are opening for them yeah, and, I, and I've always been pro. I know a, <clears throat> it was Adam Smith said in his book, 1776, that when you see three or more businessmen meeting together, they're conspiring against the masses. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're always, they, you, you put, I don't care if you put a bunch of pilots, a bunch of NFL right. football players, you put a bunch of people in any group together, they try to change all the rules so they make more money for less effort. And for me, I always thought um, that, you know, you should keep one eye on your patient and one eye on cost and use your God-given brain, three and a half pound talent to drive down costs so the customers have the freedom to afford what they have. And, and I, think, I think the third of a billion Americans would be better served if there were 
low cost dentures, having denture yeah. worlds and in the poorest part of town and right. but it and seems the like reason, their biggest enemy is always the dental society the reason i really uh, another reason i really love CEREC is having built three free clinics i can tell you that um that whole concept <clears throat> of same day dentistry um, it best serves a transient patient population and in a free clinic like chris volchek's um, yeah, like that. Um, he's a little more sophisticated than your average uh, free homeless shelter. Yeah, and sometimes you only have that one shot with a patient, and you can profoundly change their life. And if you can uh, mill a little uh, PMMA flipper, or if you can um, do a little bridge for them and deliver that and they're gone and you probably won't see them again. It is a greatly increased because, you know, the jobs available for um, a transient patient population lots of times are food service and nobody's gonna hire you if you don't have your front teeth. And so if you're able to provide that service, you're lifting someone, uh, giving them a better chance to come out of poverty. Or they'd have to move to Apache Junction where they would be Fit right in. They fit right in. Yeah, and, and you know what? Everybody that, um, every one of my friends that spent their entire career in a homeless shelter, and I'm talking about, you know, at least 30 years, tell me that 15% um, of the people, they fall on bad luck and they, they lose their home, they're homeless, and they put resources into them and get them back out. They say that's about 15% of the time. But 85% of the time, they claim that they're schizophrenic and that they're, they're always going to be drifters. And then if you, you do what the society says and we'll put them inside an apartment, put them inside of a house that they, they don't like it, they feel confined, they don't feel good, right. they want to live out on the street, and that any substance they take makes them feel better. It doesn't matter what drug, right. anything makes them. So that's 85% of the homeless population. I think my husband worked on a project where um, they went out um, and uh, counted homeless vets. And their statistics were that there's about 20% that will never come in. Um, but the amount of um, mental illness that's on the street, one of the things that I lived in California for a long time, and when Reagan came in, he closed down a majority of the mental institutions. And those folks were rolled out onto the street. They weren't uh, put in. And why did Reagan close them down? What was his Money. thinking? Oh, money. Why do Republicans close the name? Money is the answer. Are you a Republican? Well, I no, apologize. No, no I, am a, I am. I am. And you're never supposed to talk about religion yeah, oh, or sex or politics. But no, but for the record, you asked. I've been a registered libertarian my whole life. Really? Um, I don't believe. Um, re Republicans uh, never say no to any spending program, but uh, don't pay for any of them. And Republicans, Democrats never say no to any spending deal, but they want to pay for them. So you're either going to vote for Republicans and like Ronald Reagan came in and added 1.8 trillion in debt. Uh, the second George Bush added three and a half trillion. So, so the Republicans always say they're conservative, right. but when they're all done, they always add several trillion to the debt. Now we're right. 19 trillion in debt. I mean, George Bush uh, ran on small government and for every 100 federal employees when he started, when he ended, there were 127. Yeah. Yet all he talks about is smaller government. And he's a conservative, but he added three and a half trillion debt. So, Democrat, you know, at the end of the day, if I wasn't going to vote Libertarian, I'd vote for Democrat because at least Democrats will pay for their programs. Right. The they Republicans can. will just borrow the money, and so. And but I don't, I don't like either of those parties. And Americans always claim that uh, no one turns out at the election. Well, all the other twenty great democracies always have ninety-five percent turnout because they have five or six major parties. Right. But America just has two parties. They only get half the turnout because half the people, like my dental assistants, they don't identify with any of the parties. Right. But if, if you want to have 95% turnout, then you should have five or six parties. And whenever in economics you only have two companies in one industry, they, right. it's an oligopoly. Right. And, and, and you read right. all the oligopoly dysfunction in economics, and it's, it's the two-party system. So I have been a staunch supporter. I voted for Ross Perot. Yeah. yeah. Multiple system. Yeah. Um, the, I don't vote, vote for angry white guys. It's a joke. Who, who's the angry white guy? Oh, Trump? Or, or, yeah. or the Gary so Johnson? So, who's that leave if I don't vote for uh, angry white guys? Well, Gary Johnson, the libertarian. Oh, Hillary. 
Hillary. Hillary, yeah. So you think she's sick? You think she's I, ill? You know what? I've had pneumonia three different times in the last five years, and I've had to work. So when you have pneumonia and you're out there working... So you think she's got pneumonia? I think she had pneumonia, and I think... I, I don't buy into a lot of conspiracies. My dad was a... Um, attache to uh, embassy in South America right after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, you know, if I, I just don't buy into conspiracies because of the way I was raised and, you know, what my father did in the military. And uh, I just hate the... I do like... You know who I like? Oh. Is the... Uh, who's the young fellow that's just gotten on a lot of the states out of Utah. Um, yeah. I, I, McEwen, yeah. is that his name? Oh, yeah. And what's he running as? An independent or? I don't know. Google that, right? Who, who's McEwen? it? McEwen. Is he going to be an independent? But do you remember, to these kids don't remember, but do you remember Ross Perot? I do. And at the end of the election, he got about 18% of the vote. He did. But when they exit polls showed, they said, well, I would have voted for Ross Perot, but I would have thrown my vote away. When you added up all the people that said that statistically, right. you think 38% of the people would have voted for him, and he would have won. Right. But the two-party system has two PR forms. The Republicans have Fox News, the Democrats have CNN, and they're going to keep all those guys out of the debates, and they're going to try to keep right. you convinced. You only have two choices, and it doesn't work in economics, and it doesn't work in politics. Right. It's like anytime you have uh, that kind of closely held environment, dentistry is a good example, uh, why you don't have more expanded functions, why you don't have more dental health therapists on every reservation in America, why, um, or any other uh, rural area of need. I mean, all of that is part of that, you know. Okay, well, let's, let's cut to the chase. You're going to be talking to so many dental. I mean, I know you're... Um I know when I go to AT still, every dental student loves you. They all love Jack. I mean, they love that school. A lot of, back in the day when we went to dental school, half the class would have punched every instructor in the nose if they could have done it without going to jail. You know, there, yeah. I know dentists that would have literally harmed the dean if it wasn't for, you know, fear of uh, the police finding out. Because then he couldn't crack, you couldn't but, crack. But the only two schools I've ever gone to where everybody loved the dean and the teachers and that was... Um, UAP under Art Dagoni, who must be 90-something years old now, and A.T. Still in Mesa, Arizona with Jack Helmberg. And um, they're just amazing. But, but um, the podcasters are under 30. So there's hardly anybody our age that's going to be watching this. But you're talking to lots and lots of people. And, and their specific question on dental laboratories is, um, I'm coming out of school of 350000 in debt. You're talking about a $150,000 machine. Um, do you think um, they should um, go down digital dentistry with the CAD CAM? There's also other companies like like um, they will sell you just an oral scanner. Mm -hmm. So you can go digital, you can have the screen, you can oral scan it, scan that to the lab. Um, where, where, where does the, the people that just graduated from dental school two months ago to under 30, where, where should they go down Which dental laboratory? Because you've seen the dental laboratory for four decades. Where's it going? Um, well, everybody's going to use milling centers for something. Um, so a certain amount of the work will go there. If you work in a, um, uh, what are they called, DSO? Dental service organization, yeah. like, like a working, corporate dentistry. Right. If you're doing corporate dentistry. Like Heartland, Aspen, right. Pacific. Right. They'll have multiple dentists in one facility. They can afford that technology. They probably have an in-house lab doing the dentures. So you're going to have a more intimate relationship with the technician because it won't be you, the dentist, running the technical machines. It'll be a technical person. And then you have little small labs like I was before I moved into the dental school that are closely held and pride themselves in top line ceramics or aesthetics or whatever. How many of those types of labs are left do you think? Well, closely held labs? one of the things statistically uh, in the past um, the small closely held labs were formally educated dental technicians, which uh, were CDTs, 
And so uh, if you look at the statistics on that, just like dental school has old dentists, dental technology, your formal education, we're aging out of the system. So you have, when they say you have a brain in dentistry, it's just not um, in one type of uh, area. It's also dental technology. So those kinds of labs are closing, and I see, uh, I think labs really have to embrace technology. And if they embrace technology and use the benefits you can get from not having employees but sending work out to say milling I remember I was talking to a 70 year old dental laboratory owner. He says that for the first 10, 20, 30 years, he would, you know, take these kids off the street or take them out of school. They had developed tons of uh, money into filming on eight track VCR tapes right, right. on breaking down each step. And he said, I, it would take me, I would hire a person. It would take me one year to train this person. And then they could make five crowns a day. Right. And now with um, CAD cam, he said, I can take a person off the street, train them for 30 days, and then they can mill 50 crowns a day. Right. I mean, still, God, that's a, it, that's a yeah, the, crazy changer. It is a big changer. So as technicians age out of the system, we don't need as many coming into the system as we need going out of the system because of CAD CAM. But I can tell you, even if you are um, technically gifted and can sit down and learn to do uh, CAD CAM, you still need to have... Uh, someone who is a knowledge keeper of uh, emergence profile, occlusal concepts, um, staining, aesthetic, um, implant types, types of material. So you still need someone like that, but that one person can oversee, uh, you know, tons of. Things. It's funny we. Um it seems like, you know, the uh, the dentists always say we treat three diseases when I go to school. You know, it was caries disease, perio disease, and occlusal disease. And um, it seems like the occlusion is the most um, controversial. Right. I mean, you, if you lined up 10 endodontists together, you could almost not find anything they'd argue about. Um, orthodontists seem the same way. Pediatric dentists, maybe, you know, they, they only get a little crazy when you talk about... Um, that uh, silver diamine. Silver nitrate. Yeah, so is yeah, it silver, okay, it, silver diamine? Uh, yeah. But take away that issue. There, I mean, there, it's pretty. Yeah. But man, when you start talking about occlusion, you might as well just talk about religion. Right. I mean, you might as well just have a Hindu, a, you know, all these different people. Right. They just won't agree. Um, and the kids are usually saying they they want a, an answer to this. Okay. 95% of the crowns that go to the lab are single unit at a time. Triple try. But, but, then, yeah. but then the occlusion people are going to say that you're a crazy hippie lady and you ought to go back to California where you belong. Right. That, you know, so so where do you, where, how do you draw the line on occlusal disease? When, when does it go from full arch, full mouth, you know, semi-adjusted articulator to just a triple tray? How, how do you, because that, that's the relevant question. Well, but one of the things with occlusion, I have to say, is at just in the course of my tenure, when I got out of school, I worked in Southern California, and the docs I worked for um, went to UCLA, USC, uh, UOP, all of the biggies, and um, I was in the Loma Linda area, general area, so occlusion was a you know big deal. And you used fancy articulators on just about everything. But uh, nowadays you do triple trays. The, in dental school, uh, they've removed um, lab work from the curriculum. Uh, dentists in the sim lab do minimal amounts of laboratory work. So all of that extra training you got where you could understand occlusal concepts because you had to set up multiple dentures and uh, do more than a single tooth wax up. Uh, you've lost that. That's another reason I like CEREC is because all of that peripheral information they're getting because they're making a device. 
and start causing to do it. So as medicine moves into dental school, they have to move things out. They have to make room for it. And so um, because they just don't do their own lab work. And so a lot of those occlusal concepts, I think, were revolved around that. So triple trays, um, I think 95% of all work before CAD CAM um, and inner digital impressions were on triple trays. They're immensely pro profitable, popular, whatever. Uh, unless it's used appropriately, you have no chance of getting any kind of occlusal scheme that matches the existing dentition. So if it's free-ended, if it's not class one occlusion, if it's not tooth-bound, um, then you're not going to have good occlusion. If you're doing single teeth, I think you can manage that at the chair. But one of the things that's happening is you're seeing more sophisticated occlusal schemes on more sophisticated cases moving away from prosthodontists into general practice. Uh, implants have special occlusal concepts you have to tie into those. So I think it's important. I think, I think the funniest thing about, uh, I listen to debates about implants now, it's like 30 years ago, those guys were all considered quacks. I mean, I remember the guy at UMKC that was placing the most, and they, they would all call him the butcher. I mean, it was yeah. subperiosteals, it was ramus frames, and I know um, several people who did all these amazing cases, but the first one that failed, the local state board to take their license away. And, and they, they, they literally went to go live in a, in a trailer. I mean, they had their whole livelihood taken away. And, and now when people are debating over shorts or minis or this, and it's like, man, that, it was a war 30 years ago. But the occlusal war is still lingual. And, and um, another thing they, the young kids always ask about, they say, Howard, I want to learn more about occlusion. And it seems like there's two major camps. One is this uh, neurolingual muscular oral facial. Right. And one is this uh, standard uh, CR. Uh, right. uh, that's the old fashioned Dawson. way, that's the integration of medicine. And which, which way do you like? The way the prosthodontist tells me to do it. So, so I you, don't have a pony in the occlusion You don't have a race. dog in this race? No, I don't. So, okay, so how many prosthodontists do you work with? We have, um, I think four or five of them. And and let's say there's five. How many are we neuromuscular this, uh, and we, how none. many? None. We're the C... CR. Yeah, that one. So, so all five, so, so, so all five of your prosthodontists are CR. Well, what it is. What, would you call that Pinky Dawson occlusion, Coy Spear? Um, yeah. So, what, a, here's what I see the occlusion as. So, at our institution, whenever they teach in the sim lab, we have to carry onto the clinic floor. So, they're teaching the CR, CO, and as far as whose, is it panky, is it not panky? I don't know. It's, I open the textbook they have at school, and yeah. I think they use like, what, Schillenberg? I don't know, mm -hmm. and all of that. I think the people I know, the technicians I know that have gone to programs, rave about Spears. Um, the ones I know that went to LVI didn't end up. And that's neuromuscular. Yeah, and they, um, ended up with a lot they one of the things when te technicians get together they talk about and Facebook's big for this talk about what does work and doesn't work and I can remember at the heyday of LVI everybody I mean they're opening books 10 millimeters and I mean all kinds of just crazy things I tend to be a lot more conservative but you know it, a lot of it's on the, the patient I, I call a lot of stuff the aesthetic health compromise I mean Look at so many um, aesthetic things like, um, like, um, like, like all the rock star women with wigs, like Tina Turner. I mean, mm -hmm. or Dolly Parton. Every, everybody knew their wig was. Yeah. Uh, no, no one looked at her hair and said, "Oh, yeah. that's natural." You knew Dolly Parton and Tina Turner had fake uh, hair. Same thing when when breast augmentation came out. I mean, some right. of it was just crazy, but it, it's what they wanted. Same thing with veneers, this and that. Right. So some of it's patient driven. I mean, I've had some, so many crazy 
request. cosmetic request and and sometimes I've done them and sometimes I refer them to people that that well, like to yeah. that no that just like to cater to yeah you know create what I call crazy people I, I I'm all, it's not that I'm old fashioned just what do you like 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 if I had to be a pediatric dentist I'd quit I mean I just that would just drive me insane yeah. um, I'm I just like I, I love the most I love the toothache you know I'm in pain and in my office a quarter of the time you got to pull it and three quarters of the time it's a root canal belt and crown but just a satisfaction kind of like a fireman you know they you come in they're on fire they're scared they're mad they're frustrated you fix that i never really liked the boutique cosmetic where some girl comes in and says well this one's too short and this one's too long and i want yeah. this one right and it's like it's just that's just not my thing yeah, yeah. i i agree with you i tend to enjoy um more because I love three unit bridges, posterior three unit bridges. You can have all of that artistic flair, and people love them. When and you, you so you love our, our three unit bridges, yeah. I, yeah, I and let me and, let, and let, let's talk about that because um, I look at lawsuits and I look at um, 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 I'm not allowed to say this, but some dental malpractice people would never do this but send me their monthly. Um, 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 what do you call it? Um, payouts or settlements, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they they can't legally send that to me, so I can't legally tell you I have received such information for twenty years. Um, and I look at so many of these cases where uh, you had, you know, a by customer that had an MOD. You know, the tooth most likely right. to be missing is a first molar. The tooth most likely to be crown, first molar. Right. Tooth most likely to be root canal, first molar. I mean, the difference between home care at six and 12 is amazing. And you look at all this, you know, bone grafting and hit the nerve and all this shit. Like, it's like, why the hell would then they do a bridge? But when you talk about doing a three unit bridge, they look at you like, you need to just turn in your license. You're so old. That should be, that should have been an implant. And you know what? Keep it simple, stupid. Never ever try to do dentistry where you care about it more than the patient. Why did this guy need an extraction? Why did this person need an MODBL? Um, they are not dental technicians when they're home care. And God, I just look at so many cases where if they just would have done a three and a bridge, but you can't say that on Facebook. You can't say that on social media. If if, if you start saying I like three and a bridges on I Facebook, they think, so what are you, oh, Fred Flintstone's sister? Yeah, old technician. My biggest pet peeve, and um, you can see this, I've started on my um, Pinterest. I have a, a make it work or Dennis Nightmare cases, who can't make their own surgical guide and use it? All of the implant cases you see, I mean, I cannot believe the pictures on Facebook you see on a regular basis of the crappiest placed implants. And it's every country, it's um, just, volume of it and when you get into the anteriors it's just and i have seen um ent's and rhinologists who have shown um videos i'm trying to get to make courses on dental town uh, where they'll take a camera up there and it's a um it's a failing uh first molar root canal the whole inside of the sinus is covered with white fungus right. infection um sinus perforations from implants and you start looking at all all this crazy crazy junk and you're like that could have just been a bridge do you think it was okay I, because i have a theory I, when you sit at the bench you have theories on everything because you have a lot of things <laughs> so um do you think implant companies put them on the market sold them to uh outside the confines before it ever got into dental schools how to place implants. It was in commercial practice before it was integrated into curriculum. I think that uh, dental companies always have the end user do their R&D. I mean, let's go back in history. Remember Art Glass? Mm -hmm. How many dentists were sold Art Glass from Horace Colzer? Right, right. Um, yes. And the Art and the Glass evidently didn't like each other. Right. And uh, they, they didn't have five-year studies on this stuff, did they? And then another great company, um, Ivaclair, remember? Um, 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 
What was it called? Concept. Um, uh, con concept was by who? Wasn't that an Ivor Clark? I, what was Ivor Clark's? Uh, Targus Vectris. Oh, okay. That concept was someone else's. Well, and how, how, did you, how did you like Targus Vectris? I, I bought the kit. Six months later, Chris Jensen came out with his study on it. Yeah. And I, you couldn't return it. This is well, I, one I, of the I, reasons I got into. But, look, but look, let's talk about one lesson real quick. Okay. okay. So here's the difference between me at 54 and you listen to this at 24. When you're young, um, you jump on bleeding edge. And this stuff will come out. It'll be Targus Vectors. It'll be Art Glass. It'll be the latest, greatest stuff. And you watch all the 50 year old grandpas. We're like, oh, brand spanky new. Oh. Let's let all the dumbass kids try this for five years and see if it works. And you jump on every damn new implant, composite, bonding agent. You'll jump on it all while we're sitting back there saying, I got stuff that works. I already got stuff that works. I've got stuff that I've been using for 10, 20, 30 years. And then after five years, it goes from bleeding edge to leading edge. And then we're the late adopters. Everyone who's an early adopter is a dumbass under 30 who tries every new thing. And as soon as you stick your tongue in a light socket three or four times yeah. with art glass you and Targus Vectris and Concept and bonding agents and all this stuff that's just, just made you lose sleep and cough right. up blood. There were some nasty lawsuits with some of that stuff. Didn't some dental labs do take art glass to the... Uh, yeah, and I think went through some one major the million dollar settlements. Overlay composites. This is my favorite one. I read the court case, and I can't remember. When, when you put two dissimilar things together, like art over glass, targets over vectors, yeah. it's never going to be pretty in the thermal cycling of the mouth from hot to cold to hot one to cold to hot to cold. I got into I for just for enjoyment now. I read the FDA website, and one of the things I've lectured on was the. Um, because of Dentaltown um, and uh, global trade, I started looking into dental lab related things with FDA. And so uh, early in the aughts, I did a lot of lecturing on that in the Medical Device Directive in Europe. I've had uh, implants that have been pulled that the company it couldn't get to the doctor fast enough to reimburse them that I had five, six thousand dollars in um, crowns I redid being told I'd be for implants. Overfailed implants that it was a technical problem, the FDA was involved. Again and they'll 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 these kids will save money and they'll buy an implant for eighty nine dollars from a country they can't find on a map and then other people are saying, Well, you know, you might want to get a household name. I mean, there, there's a lot of players that aren't going away, like I, Noble BioCare, Strawman. I am a strong proponent and advocate of staying in the system. One of the things when you talk about the young guns is in dental technology, a lot of the upcoming aesthetic guys in dental technology are cowboys and um, go out of system with ceramics. So if I'm fully vested in Emacs, and I believe that staying in that system makes my product better, and you're using somebody else's overlay porcelain and glaze, but still calling it an Emacs when you market it to your doctor, I'm getting screwed. So isn't it funny to watch how these, uh, these clinicians the minute they change companies, how they change everything they endorse yeah. on their lecture. I mean, it's just, it's literally comical. How many of the, uh, of the CIRAC people are now that they were bought by Densply will dump Emacs and start lecturing for the Densply product right. overnight? Well, you see. Well, what, what, what percent of them? A uh, hundred. A hundred. If you're, you're thinking, like, well, well, what happened to all the great things you said about Emacs? Yeah. Oh, well, see, we were bought by Densply. And, you, I mean, I could go back for 30 years. Some of the greatest names ever, they were all for this. Right. Then you go to the next lecture, and everything they talk about is a different company. Right. And it's like, can you guys not see that it's and a change of sponsorship? Are, so if you have... This is why we call this dentistry uncensored. It is. So if you have... Um, if you bought a porcelain system because someone tells you it's the best, most aesthetic thing you can get, and you get that system and you believe in that particular guru, and eight months later 
they're no longer um, subsidized because a lot of dental technology education dollars that used to go into dental tech programs, teaching programs, now go towards gurus to let them have their little aesthetic shows. So now these guys have moved on to the next thing and you're, here's your $3,000 um, system and they're trying to tell you, no, this one's even better, which is exactly what you just said. It happens all the time. And We should write, we should go get all these old uh, videos and YouTube videos and lectures and just right. start the name of every <laughs> speaker and then follow their doors and say, here's the only things this guy recommended. Then it all changed exactly on August 12th. Well, and it all went to this. Things, then it changed back. I mean, it's just... One of the things... And, and no one ever calls bullshit on them. Or do you think they it's do? It's never It's never in a format. If you're going to lecture, you're not going to stand up and call bullshit. Very few people do. Facebook, all full of bullshit. Um, Dental Town. I think as tough as it can be sometimes to argue a point because you're getting trolled left and right. But you got a report abuse button. Oh, I know. You do. We ban someone no, every I week. Don't, I, don't mean <laughs> that kind of, I don't mean that kind of trolling. It would be when I, when I call you out on overlaying Emacs with some other porcelain that's outside of the system and you come back and call me a crazy old bitch. I'd report you for calling me a crazy old bitch, but if you say something a little less offensive than that, and it starts a discussion, that's where that happens, at that type of communication. So calling someone out isn't gonna happen in a- And in that's, a why, that's why I think you guys, um, it's funny because um, did you go to the CDA meeting in Anaheim? Well, I mean, most everybody has been reporting for 10 years that convention attendance is going down and down right. and down and down and down. And a lot of companies are saying, I can't afford to go put a booth at a convention that a decade ago had twice as many people. And whenever I'm lecturing those conventions, they always show you know the charts of declining attendance. And then I look at Dental Town, where we put up 350 online courses. And they've been right. viewed, um, I, I forgot how many, but it's like, you know, well, half whole, a million times, but... The whole nature of how you, um, um, how you garner your education now has changed. And so I think we're looking at internet-driven education, uh, knowledge on demand. Um, I think that that's the need that Dentaltown um, has fulfilled. And I think that the ability to have any time I need to know a process I'm not familiar with, I can jump on Dental Town, I can find something so that when I have to go talk to a student about it, I'm a little bit more comfortable because it's their bailiwick, not mine. And I think that's where you're gonna find, that's how it's gonna change. But the, point I, was make, the change. point I was making is that in a lecture, um, the way humans are, and I'm looking at you, it just doesn't feel uncomfortable to stand up and call bullshit. Right. But when you do online, or on Facebook, or on, on Deal, right. you then you can do your homework and research, and you can sit there and say, wait a minute, uh, I'm calling bullshit now. Right, and, and then and also I think there's that an anonymous layer. So, um, if you could, what, and I hope you go back and look for the uh, beginning of the offshore trade, uh, it's, on the lab section and it went on for years and it, it really is the history of that process and how it impacted dental technology but if it, that, that could be a book couldn't it it could be but if you go and look at it as people were comfortable with just uh calling out and yeah. it's a format that you're comfortable on. So we're, we're, what's the status of back back to those days? So what's the status now in Chinese labs? I mean, I remember going, I remember lecturing at um, Modern Dental Lab in Shenzhen, the largest lab in the world. Right. And uh, had 4,000 employees and right. these UPS trucks would come. And what was amazing is um, those cases were from every lab you'd seen in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you come back to the United States and these dentists think, oh, I send it to this lab. I'm like, dude, I was in China. That that case is going all the way to Shenzhen. Yeah. Um, what, what's what's the status of Chinese labs in 2016? Like like Modern Dental. What, what's I, their? I don't monitor as much. I think they're 
especially if you have dentists that have economic interest, uh, you know, partially mm -hmm. own, then I think certain DSOs use, use them and use them a lot. I think what's happened is good old American ingenuity, or actually German ingenuity, and CAD CAM. Right. So when a technician uh, moans and groans about uh, the work went offshore, well, it's come back a large, large, large portion It went offshore of for cheaper labor when it was labor intensive. Yeah. And then when and it got technologically no CAD CAM. And, yeah. And what, what was so exciting is, um, and Modern Dental, while it was, it started off, these labs got very, very big because where labor was very expensive in the United States and Germany and Switzerland right. and, you know, they were sending them to China right. because the, the labor was so much lower or cost. But as the CAD CAM went back, they were developing big domestic markets, which is what in economics you would want. And uh, last I heard, almost all of uh, Modern's uh, clients were Chinese people. That's what uh, right. China needs to go from. An, um, you know, you're never going to be successful when you make all your money exporting to rich countries. You need right. to develop your people so that those people buy all your right. iPhones and crowns and bridges. And, and that's, that's why I'm really excited about China because their domestic market is growing. Their so, own market. yeah, and a country and should going, be fine without any trade. We're going back to um, tapping our own. One of the things I wanted to. Uh, Tell you, we talked about earlier about clinical scope of technicians. So when I first started looking at regulated dental technicians, um, I looked at um, Canada, Australia, Germany. They have strong regulation. Their technicians are regulated, formal education, licensure. You have to have, a, I think in Germany, don't you have a master's degree to own a lab? Um, but then uh, global trade came in. And I always thought, well, if we had regulation, our, uh, we'd be protected. Just like dentists have licensure, they're protected. And I thought, well, it wouldn't be such a bad thing. I wanted it more for the education, but I think. But then global trade came in, it impacted every market. It impacted heavily regulated technician markets and the um, markets with no regulation, like our market. So we were impacted. But what I did start to see, because it all revolved around the skill standard, which um, I looked at the standards from UK, Australia, every English speaking country, Germany, is that the areas, the countries that have a clinical scope for their technician uh, had less decline in their technician populations and actually had increases and so the scope started to, so global trade happened and the scope started to improve and in, increase based on the closer technician gets to the patient, the more secure their employment is and the more likelihood it'll be a profession. So that's what I learned. That was profound. Um, that was profound. Well, you know, I think that, um, I think, you know, uh, Fred Joel, my buddy, says everything is marketing. And I always say, you know, everything is just HR. Everything is management. Um, you know, government tries to manage people. Religion tries to manage people. Business tries to manage people. Uh, I'm a father. I try to manage four boys and a granddaughter. It's just all human relations. And I, I think that um, countries and businesses need uh, more competition and more transparency. And they always try to be secretive and they don't want any competition. I mean, it's amazing how many of these uh, leadership gurus are out there all talking about free free enterprise. Free training, the patient doesn't know where the crown's made. Let's talk about free trade. Yeah, and they're out there writing books about free trade, but they're giving the politicians money to set up all these trade barriers yeah. and they don't want any competition and, and all things well, like that. Well, that was one of the things about um, the integration of, you know, the global trade was um, everybody would say, oh, patients, you know, it improves the bottom line. Patients never got any of the difference between the cost of my crown 210 and the $39 coming out of, that all went in your pocket, Howard, and you know it, <laughs> or who would ever, yeah. so that's not true. The other thing, free trade is every person in that chain of distribution is aware and buys into the fact that it's a transparent system. We know that's not trade. Every attempt for the patient to be 
informed on where their uh, crown comes from has been stepped on, either by organized religion, state boards, uh, devious lab owners, foreign lab owners. And so you either have free trade or you don't have free trade. You either have a transparent system or you don't have. But I don't buy into the uh, it's free trade and no, oh, it's not free trade. Yeah. It's it's uh, and and you go around the world. Money's the answer. What's the question? Yeah. In every country from Brazil to Mexico, the United States, the governments yeah. are all kickbacks, bribes. It's 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 laughing when we it's call. Who hides it better? Yeah, and it's it's laughable when countries talk about when Americans talk about how corrupt other countries are. It's like my God, yeah. the, our congressmen spend half their day telephoning for dollars. Right. And that's all kickbacks, that's all quid, quid quid pro, it's all play to play. I want to I want to end on a racist white woman question. Can okay. I can I ask you a racist white woman yes, question? Sure. Um, you probably never thought this question. What, all my restorations are gold. I see gold restorations admired in Phoenix by Hispanics, African American Russians, I, 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 in the last four months, we've lectured, you know, Africa, girls go in, in, in uh, Soweto and Johannesburg I and have Tanzania. That I have and that they, they go in there and get teeth crowned up front that are virgin teeth, or just, you go to Malaysia and Indonesia, they'll put little gold foils, and they're just rocking it, and they're hot, and they're gorgeous. But it's only white women like Lizzie. No, who no. won't let you put any gold in their mouth, but right. but hang it on their ear, their nose, or belly okay, button. There you the go. Deal. What's the deal? So uh, when I was in dental <laughs> tech school, yeah. uh, we were 12 miles from Loma Linda, so I got to go to a lot of the lectures over there. One of them was uh, uh, Sami Tanaka. This was years ago. Terry Tanaka? No, uh, or uh, a, Tom. I think it was a Sami. Okay, Japanese. Yeah. And he gave a lecture, and in that lecture, he had a card of black denture teeth. And those black denture teeth reflected uh, the aesthetic of chewing on, uh, is it lychee nuts? And they turn your teeth black. In order to be able to afford lychee nuts, you had to be a certain economic social class. So to... Uh, when you'd have your denture, you'd want to appear like you're that social economic class. So in countries that have gold piping around the anterior crowns, that is a socioeconomic way to display your wealth. In America, mm. we have a cultural thing where we're all hooked into Hollywood or you know what we see on TV. And so the bleached white picket fence, square, no embrasure, even in sizal edges, is considered uh, upwardly mobile, Hollywood, and so- Wealth. Wealth, yeah, and it's a reflection of that. And so if you look like any of the countries that whatever their particular aesthetic is, and what part of the human race has to be the most aesthetic? If you, and now this is my uh, feministic coming out. To you, uh, chances are you don't feel as compelled about an aesthetic appearance as a woman does. And so. Well, I'm just banking that at my age, all the women are losing their vision and they're wearing yeah, readers. Yeah, you and won't be able to, won't be able to see, see me very well. Oh, stop. Um, you know what I see? I, I love the pictures of you and your boys or the you after, I still have that on my Facebook, or on my phone, is you after that race a couple years ago, and you have like a, a rain hood on, and you look <laughs> like you've been beat, but you have this little metal <laughs> hanging there. I love that picture. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, I just want to say for the record that um, I have never had DNA testing done on my four boys. I assume they're not mine. Oh. I just assume. That's what gets me through the day, Ryan. What do your kids say? <laughs> I forget which boy it was. That came and worked for you. Mm -hmm. So my boys are Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach. It's alphabetic order. All um, Eric's 27. When he um, got done with NAU, he didn't know what to do. And his dad was in dentistry. So you took him under your wing for a couple and weeks. And did this Eric thing. He was wonderful. I know. But you know what? He, he drew the line. He, um, he always told me since he was a little kid. 
that he felt sorry for people who had to work indoors. And so he went to college. He wanted to get a degree in forest service because he thought. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, he now he uh, his his love was rock climbing. And so he found out that uh, cell phone towers, which is booming, they can't get anybody to climb a thousand square foot and tower and install. Outdoors, rock. So climbing. he um, he sends me selfies of him hanging upside down at a thousand feet, installing a Verizon box. And they fly him, and he drives all over the United States doing that. And then um, the second one, Greg, he worked for me for a couple of years. He loves uh, uh, sales. Um, Ryan, after NAU, came and decided to clean up Old Man Dad's podcast. And we just released our 500th podcast yesterday. And 500. They've been viewed a million times. Is this right? That's just on iTunes. That's you had you had iTunes and YouTube and Dental Town, but Ryan took the show from amateur league to professional league and to that I think for it. And Zach is now his second year in dentistry. And what's he doing? He um he wants the um he's been a dental assistant now on year two. He worked for me for a year, and then he's working for my best friend Tom Madden across the street. We're both in Ahwatukee. He he <laughs> he noticed that um. Uh, you know, he I, I introduced him to too many people when he was mm -hmm. growing up, and he, he he'll never forget me introducing him to Steve Thorne, and I told him the boys I said, you know, Steve Thorne's dad was a dentist, and he was going to go to dental school just like his dad, but he decided that he could hire a dentist in eight minutes, and why would you go to school for eight years when you could hire a dentist in eight minutes? Yeah. And now he has five hundred dental offices, and Zach kept saying. Yeah, dental school is four years. I could probably own four dental offices before I got out of dental school. I have a, a couple of technician friends that actually own. Oh, yeah. And hire. There's a hygienist in town, Kim Mack. Yeah. She owns eight dental offices. She used to be a hygienist. Now she owns eight really? dental offices. Kim Mack, I want to podcast you in this chair. You're in Phoenix, in my backyard. Come talk to me. That, that's pretty um, exciting times when a dental assistant can realize that Steve Thorne has 500 offices and he never went to dental school. Yeah. Kim Mack is a registered dental hygienist MBA and owns, I don't know, 8, 10, 12, 14 yeah. offices in town. Um, an amazing lady who does a lot of volunteering and I always see her. But what, he'll ta what your boy will take from you is your business sense because I think that's one of the things when I listen to you talk or any of that, is that that part of dentistry is equally important, and I'm sure he picked that up. And I'm sure that's the differentiator. If you're listening to this in dental school, which I think about 20% of you are dental students, is that um, if you don't have a flair for business, you should you should go work for a big corporation. You really should. I mean, have an eight to five job. Um, just do your amazing dentistry at five o'clock go home and and leave it all at the door if you need to be a soccer dad a soccer mom whatever but if you love business and i believe at birth you, you, it's, it's a game you want to play or don't want to play i mean if you don't want to play chess if you don't want to play checkers if you don't want to play business then then don't open up your own business i was going to tell you that it takes um we were talking earlier about dentistry and evidence why a lot of our products fail in research and development. I read something the other day that it takes 17 years for uh, for medical-based evidence to be worked into actual practice. I yeah. like to think it's shorter. And I, I love to study religion because um, it's, it's a, a different than economics and like in economics like 20% of everybody, all my friends with PhDs in economics, think the stock market's gonna crash and right, right. we'll be you know, living off gold buried in her backyard. You go to religion, like 20% of the people think the end of the world's around the corner. I mean, my, my mom, at least every five or six years, goes into a six month end of the world spell. And, um, and these evidence-based medicine people um, are kind of remind me of uh, the people in religion and politics that think they know it all and what humans never realize they they only know what they know we have no idea what we don't know yeah. and i'm pretty sure the what we don't know pie part of the pie is amazingly bigger and than the, the what we know yeah. considering we're only two thousand years past socrates yeah. i mean i mean you know so the evidence-based people they just uh they're so they so believe they know it all yeah and after 54 laps around the sun i mean, I mean look at this one little thing when i was in um chemistry in college, the atom was 99.9999999% empty space. 
So there was just almost nothing in matter. And the fact that you just talk about how theoretically you could put your hand right through concrete because empty space, empty uh -huh. space. Okay, now it's only been, it wasn't even 20 years as, oh, well, wait a minute, now there's dark matter and dark energy and there's no empty space. And, and that area of space has so much more density. It's like, well, how did we go from absolutely nothing to yeah. dark matter and dark energy, you know, so. Do you follow, um, I follow him on Twitter, Cochran? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, do you read, I, even if it's a study uh, that they um, can't really base a conclusion, I'll go in and read what their conclusion was. How can you have evidence-based dentistry when the quality of the research in dentistry is And so every bad. time they do a study, they'll say, okay, we'll review 12 studies. They were all too small. They were all laid out wrong. Yeah. The, the quality was horrible. Yeah. How they did this. And thing. here's their almost insignificant conclusion. Yeah. But, uh, okay, well, hey, thank you so much uh, for coming welcome. over to my house. Thank you so much.